So we'll get started now by inviting Ya. Ya is our lead for Pi Ladies Ghana to give us the welcome address. Yeah, please can you give us the welcome address. Okay, great. Um, hello everyone. Um, you are welcome to our Pi Ladies Night for July. So my name is Ya, and um, I'm currently serving as the Pi Ladies, the community lead for the com um, for Pi Ladies Ghana. So I'll, I, I'll really, I, I really, I'm really happy to serve you all in this amazing community. And tonight we have gathered here um, to delve into the exciting world of crafting proposals for Python conferences. Okay, so whether you are new to the community or a seasoned Pythonista, I assure you that this session will be filled with valuable insights and practical tips to help you step up your proposal game and shine at any conference for slides. Okay, so before we begin, let me take a moment to express my deepest gratitude to all of you here being part of this amazing community. And um, tonight's, um, tonight's session is a testament to our commitment to fostering a diverse and inclusive tech landscape. We firmly believe that um, everyone's, everyone here has a unique perspective and valuable experiences to share. And crafting a compelling proposal for a Python conference is one way to amplify your voice and our voices. As we delve and dive into this discussion, I encourage you all to be open to new ideas and insights. I guess speaker Chuk, Chuk is, a, is an amazing person with a wealth of experience in the world of Python conference proposals. Her guidance and expertise will be invaluable to all of us here, whether you are considering submitting your first proposal or looking to refine your existing skills, um, you are the right place. Um, we are all here to learn, support and uplift each other. So don't hesitate to ask questions, share your thoughts and engage in a fruitful discussion. Um, remember, Palladies Ghana is not just about technical excellence, but it's also about forming meaningful connections and building a network that lasts a lifetime. Once again, thank you for being part of Pi Ladies Ghana and a warm welcome to our esteemed guest speaker, Chok Tempo. Let's make the most of this evening, empowering ourselves with knowledge and embarking on a journey of growth and achievement together. Okay, so without further ado, let's give our favorite, let's give a virtual round of applause for Chok Tempo. You can give a clap in the chat. Yeah, and let the Pali this nice session begin. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for that um, amazing welcome address. Um, I'm just going to introduce our guest quickly. We have um Chuk on the call here with us, and she's going to be sharing our experiences with us. Um, just a quick introduction about Chuk. After having a career as a data scientist and developer advocate, Chuk dedicated her work to open source community. She has co-founded Humble Data, beginner Python workshop that has been happening around the world. She has served the EuroPython Society board for two years and is now in the Python Software Foundation Board of Directors. Congratulations, Chuk, on your new appointment to the Python Software Foundation. Um, if you can unmute yourself and just say like a quick hello to everyone on the call. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, sorry for all these uh, technical difficulties. It's my first time using Telegram, uh, which is, you know, um, not usually what I do, but uh, we will figure it out. So um, let's talk about uh, the first slide. So that would be, you already have the link of the slide, which is absolutely fine. You can now see the slide as well, which is great. And feel free to contact me if you have more questions uh, about, um, you know, if you have any questions, you can contact me. You can find all my social media uh, on the first slide, which is fine. So next one. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I can see some people can see. OK, <laughs> so uh, I'm Chuck and uh, I am contributing to open source a lot of them. Uh, I love contributing to open source. I also love organizing a lot of events. Um, so <laughs> I, I always tell people there's like if there's something you want to improve about an event, uh, get you know involved and try helping the event and you can have something that you like. <laughs> so um, I highly encourage if you 
you know, have the passion of making the community better, then um, yeah, give it a try. Um, as uh, I was introduced before, I am uh, just elected as the Private Software Foundation Director. I was also a Private Software Foundation Fellow before. Um, so it just means that uh, you can talk to me about anything uh, regarding the Python community. I will see uh, what I can help you you about. So um, I am also going to start a new role about open source supply chain security. So uh, again, because I love open source projects, so if you have any questions about open source, you can also um, talk, talk to me about it. So first, uh, let's talk about why do I want to start speaking publicly, uh, especially in tech. So why you, you could also think about speaking publicly, right? I usually tell people that, uh, of course, uh, you can gain a lot by speaking publicly. Uh, is you know you can uh, benefit a lot by starting to speak publicly. That's how I usually motivate people to do it. Um, so first thing, of course, uh, if you are trying to look for, uh, for example, if you are changing career, if you are looking for a new role, um, then it's actually good to have. Uh, some speaking experience to talk about certain topic that may be related to your um, your new role that uh, you you can put that on your CV right you can put it on LinkedIn put it on a CV so to to let people know uh, or share it on social media that um, you have given a talk about this topic that you have some knowledge about it and show your future employer that um, you are not you know. Because a lot of times when you apply for a job, they would give you a coding challenge. They would ask you a lot of questions. They want to to check whether you know certain things. So by giving a talk, that would be quite easy. Just like contributing to open source, you can give some reference of what you know uh, for your, uh, food, you know, uh, the, the hiring manager, for example, that um, they want to check with the candidate know this knowledge. You can show it by giving a talk. And another thing, uh, even if you're, oh, I'm not looking for a job, I'm already happy. I have a, uh, for example, I, I'm working as a developer. I'm happy about my role. But by giving talks, you can actually build up your credibility. You can show that this is what you learn at work and you know about it, right? So it's, it's good to, uh, for maybe future proof uh, to also, I, I personally found that uh, by giving talks, I learn a lot from giving talks as well. Uh, I would sometimes you know uh, try to give a talk about certain topic that i want to research about i want to learn about so by doing that you can study about the topic you learn about the topic and you can tell people about it um another thing is that for example if you have an opinion about a certain topic for example right now i have opinion about why everybody especially women need to give talks <laughs> and uh, that's why I'm, I'm speaking about that right now i want to tell people this is what i think um, sometimes I would tell people, for example, there's some regulations, government regulations they have to pay attention about, or um, even, you know, you can give a live stream talk about a certain event that uh, you want people to know about. So um, it's a kind of channel for you to voice out your opinion about certain things. And I think there isn't enough women's voice in the community. So I that's why I think like, oh, it's really good, like if, I'm speaking at uh, Pi Ladies Ghana. I want to encourage more ladies to to give their opinion about things because I, as as women, a lot of times when we grow up as little girl, uh, we we are told that we should uh, sometimes keep our opinion to our own, which I think is not very helpful in our community. It it will be um, the opinion in the community will be not balanced if we if there's missing certain voice from a certain group of people. Um, another benefit that you could gain from giving talks is you can make friends. You can get involved more in the community. You, uh, so for me, I have a lot of friends in the community, which I'm really thankful for. And um, so I can tell you a little bit my journey later. I started by going to speak at events. And of course, after that, I, I want to change something about the event. I try to get involved and all that stuff. But, um, my first step is actually speaking at events. Like by being a speaker, you are actually involved a little bit more uh, in different events. So it's not just you're participating, you're also, so people will know your name, people know that you're passionate about something, they will try to approach you, maybe talk about certain things that you also want to talk about. So this is a very good way of making new friends in the community. 
another thing is uh, you can of course gain from speaking is to make it into your career by like make speaking uh, a tech events your career so uh, now i think uh, people start hearing about this uh, position called developer relations or this kind of tech field that's called developer relations so a lot of roles in the developer relations actually require uh, certain skills or you can prove in that you're actually able to speak in front of people and being a public speaker is actually something that is really good uh, if you want to get you know start a new career in that field um, to show that you can do it you have confidence uh, you have your confidence you can convince people you can tell people what you think about certain things which is voicing out your opinion so um, you can actually build a career out of it if you're interested in that kind of things so I will tell you a little bit about my journey, um, how I get there is, uh, first of all, I was a um, data scientist. So I just started uh, learning Python because my team, my data science team, is everybody use Python, so I have to learn Python. So I learned Python. And then um, the team decided to let's go to a conference together. So, um, so we did. Uh, but before that, let me uh, rewind a little bit. So before that, I already go to a lot of meetups that different uh, uh, I go to a meetup very similar to Pi ladies so there are lots of ladies they're very supportive they you know uh, they always think that we should you know try different things go out of our comfort zone and then uh, the, there's a big conference happening in London where I live which is Pi Data London and uh, at that time because the data science team is using Python we all think that oh maybe we should go to the conference so we all uh, try to get a ticket to go there so um, I was really excited about Pi Data London, so um, I want to, you know, get involved a little bit more uh, because, of course, I got uh, encouraged by my friends in the supportive community. So, um, so the other uh, people, my friend, they uh, encouraged me to give a talk. So, okay, I, I submit my talk uh, to Pi Data London, but um, I got rejected. <laughs> um, so. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about like rejection. Actually, it's quite common. Um, so yeah, my first talk, I submitted a proposal, it got rejected, but I didn't give up because, um, so I ended up not speaking if I did in London, I just bought a ticket uh, with the help of my employer at the time and I go with the team, I go there, but I meet other organizers uh, for PyData, Amsterdam, other PyData. So I try again and submit it to PyData Amsterdam. And I got accepted this time. So my first, actually my first speaking opportunity actually is not in London where I live. It's actually in Amsterdam, which require a little bit of traveling, but I took the opportunity. I try to um, speak there for the first time. Um, I think that maybe you can still find the recording. I think it's 2018 in Pi Amsterdam. You can still find the recording. Um, yeah, it, it was it was my first speaking opportunity at a conference. So, um, but the experience was really great. I got addicted, and I really want to do do it more, do it even full time, right? So, um, so after Pi Amsterdam, I keep submitting different talks to different events. I got more and more speaking opportunities, and at some point that I was being too involved in speaking at conferences. Um, I have to decide whether I want to keep on working as a data scientist or change my career. So I decided to change my career. I decided to become a developer advocate. So uh, at that time I looked for roles of a company, uh, especially startups that are looking for people who can go and speak in events and convince people um, or teach people how to use their products. So, um, that's how I started and that's how I actually switched from being a data scientist from, to now like being someone who get a lot of engagement with the community. So that all I talk about before is about how someone, for example you or me, who can gain a lot of opportunity by speaking at different conferences, you can you know, you can make a lot of friends, get engaged in the community or even start a career by speaking at events. I also look at things in a community way, like why we should have more women speaking at events. What do the community gain by having more women speaking at events? So first of all, have you heard of some something called manference or memo? Well, maybe you haven't heard of it because it's a new term that uh, my friend and I has invented 
what does it mean is that because uh, a man friends uh, means a conference or manner means a panel that consists of only cis white male. So this is a definition kind of apply to uh, you know maybe North America or Europe that you know uh, the community is mainly consists of cis white male. So I guess in the local community Ghana it would be maybe male <laughs> um, who uh, who uh, you know more. Uh, uh, the majority of the of the community, and if the conference speaker or the keynote speaker is only consists of male, or the panel is only consists of male, that is not very healthy. Um, so I have once uh, communicate with an organizer because I realized on the website that they only have a male keynote speaker. So I talked to them. I asked like, oh, hey, why is it the case? Because I've been to that conference before and I think that, oh, wow, like, you know, I don't want it to become a man friends, right? So I, I talked to the organizer and asked like, how can I help? Uh, do you want to find more female speakers? And he said that. Um, so I can hear a lot of excuses from the organizer. So um, some of the excuse that I received was, um, Oh, it's very hard to find female speaker that uh, as good as the as the one that we already have. Uh, we, you know, choose the keynote speaker based on their merit. We won't choose a keynote speaker just because someone is from an underrepresented group, like for example, female. Uh, or, or we have to cater what our audience want to hear. We want to select more uh, technical talks, which, uh, you know, I can't find a female speaker to talk about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I got really angry when I hear those excuses because what I the message is kind of like saying that speaker other than those cis white male that is on the web page, but like as if there's no female speaker, right? That's just like oh as as if we are not good enough, as if like female speaker are, are not as good, like as if female speaker can't give really good technical talks or um no one is interested in what what we want to say like even because sometimes you know um i don't want to talk about just technical topic i want to talk about other things for example regulations and stuff i think it's also very important but as if nobody's interested in that and nobody wants to hear what i think is important and people should know about and i get really angry and really sad so um, at the end, I have more conversation with this organizer, and luckily the situation have have been improved. So at the end, they have invited a, a female keynote speaker, and she is great. She is amazing. She is as good as the other keynote speaker that he has invited. Um, so so hopefully things are changing, and more organizers are realizing that they should uh, have a broader representation of people, but not just certain group of people that are the majority in the community. Um, so please, please prove them wrong. So ladies, please start becoming a speaker. Um, start, you know, go out there. If, if you want to try, you know, I would totally encourage you to try it. You will get better and better. And then one day maybe you will be the one who is giving the keynote. You will be the one who will show them that, you know, female speaker is also as good as male speaker and we can also give very important messages and very engaging talks. Um, another thing that I think uh, not everybody here attending, maybe not all of them identify as female, maybe we have some allies here as well. So, or if you're a lady, you have some friends that they, they are supporting you, they are your ally, um, tell them that um, if they have been invited to men funds or men if just if they see that the um, are all the other speakers look exactly like them, then maybe um, they should refuse and tell the organizer that oh I think that I am not adding a lot of values in this conference or panel because everybody is just like me. The opinions will be the same. Maybe we should have a different voice. Um, so consider maybe my friend, maybe that friend is you, um, that it could give a different opinion and can add more value to the conference and panel. So now I want all of you to become a superstar uh, speaker. So, but, but but how how should how should I start? How should you start? So I am going to give you some tips. So first of all, I think everybody um, find a safe environment. PyLadies is a very, very good place to start. Uh, I 
also started to get some support from the community uh, from a local meetup. Uh, it's not exactly Palladies, but it's also a meetup that's catered for um, supporting underrepresented group. I think uh, having that environment is very important. So local meetup, I've just mentioned, so it's like one of the um, safe environment that you can find. Usually, you know, it's a, uh, you know, very tight needed group. People are very supportive. So, um, you know, if you're giving your talk the first time, you may be a little bit nervous, but people are just, you know, your audience just look at you smiling, you know, that they, they really want you to be great. You know, that, that that's a actually a good feeling. Um, another thing you could try is that if, because I know some companies, they will encourage their employee to um, maybe give a presentation. They have this thing called all hands, which everybody have a chance to give a presentation. So maybe you can try giving a presentation at your uh, internal company event. But of course, uh, I assume that your company is super supportive. Um, you know, uh, if, if it's not a very supportive environment, maybe you can find an excuse to <laughs> not do it. But I hope that uh, your colleagues are supportive and, you know, uh, and want you to be successful. So giving a talk at the internal event is less scary than giving a talk in a public event because you know everybody who's listening to you. So um, another thing is that uh, if you have, for example, uh, you, you don't want need to limit yourself to maybe just Pi Ladies, there may be other communities out there that uh, you know support inclusion and diversity. Some of the PyCons, they are doing better than the other, but generally PyCon should have a code of conduct and should be supportive and should be diverse. That's also one of the mission of the Python Software Foundation. Um, so I just uh, hope that all the PyCon actually is going to that direction, or you can just um, maybe try to look out for which PyCon is doing that uh, very well, and you can try um, maybe speaking there as well. So uh, another very good indicator I just mentioned is the code of conduct. So um, look out for that. Um, generally, if an event doesn't have a code of conduct, uh, don't speak there, don't attend, <laughs> don't participate, because um, I can't guarantee that it will be a very safe environment if there's not a code of conduct that is effective. So effective is also a very important word. So it's not just, oh, check their website whether they have a code of conduct, putting a code of conduct on a website is very easy, but having a mechanism of people can report and after people report, action will be taken is very important. So those are a little bit difficult to verify, but if you have friends who have already participated, maybe ask for their opinion, whether the experience is great or not. So um, that's a very tricky uh, situation, but you know, if they don't even have a code of conduct, maybe then you already can rule them out. So do look out for that. Um, and also another thing, like you know, like Palladies, you know, is an online event, so it's um, it's a little bit less scary than uh, talking to a audience that they have all these like uh, eyes that's looking to you. <laughs> um, so online events are a little bit easier if you are still very nervous about giving a live online event that uh, maybe a recorded event would also help you because then you can, you know, you know that it won't be live. If you do the first take, you don't like it, you can do the second take. Um, but personally, the, for me, there's also a disadvantage because then you spend a lot of time trying to make your talk perfect. Um, but, you know, if you think that, oh, if I am giving a talk live, it's very nervous, then maybe look for an online event that would also accept recorded talks. Then you could uh, try a different format, found something that works for you, um, that makes you feel comfortable to take your first step. So another thing that I think really help is to find a mentor. So um, if I could, I would love to mentor all of you, but uh, unfortunately I'm only one person. I can't you know, multiply myself and mentor everybody. So um, I started some program which I, Hopefully I can, you know, uh, not multiply myself, but recruit more people who can also help out. So a mentorship program, uh, I have started it years ago. Now there's a, a, an, an amazing volunteer running it. I won't take credit for what is going on right now because someone has uh, been running it. Python, and we have a mentorship program that uh, hopefully we would encourage more new speakers, especially 
uh, speakers from underrepresented group can join our program and can um, get some support to take the first step to find a uh, speaking opportunity. Another thing is that if you have a colleague or a friend, you know that they have done speaking before and you think they are good, you think they are very supportive, then maybe asking them. So a lot of times you'll be surprised by uh, how willing people are uh, willing to help, you know, so you just need to ask. And a lot of people, uh, especially people you, you know, then they, they're actually happy to help you out. Um, or ask someone who may not be your friends or colleague, but someone in the, the community. Uh, someone may be in the pie ladies community, you know, maybe try asking in, in this pie ladies, or if you want to explore a little bit more, maybe the pie ladies Slack, ask if anybody to, uh, you know, have time and be able to help. Uh, sometimes you'll be surprised because uh, I, me, myself, I have, you know, not just about speaking, but about other things. Uh, I reach out to people in the community and everybody is super, super helpful. And I am surprised that like, this is very different from my experience uh, previously in my other work, right? I, I, I discovered that this community here is actually, people are super supportive and I'm very, very surprised um, by it. So another thing that you could do uh, is to think about what you want to do for your first talk. So um, there are a few suggestions that I would give to people who want to try out um, to uh, give the first talk is to try the lightning talk. So lightning talk for those of you who may be um, new to going to a conference or an event. So lightning talk usually are talks that are shorter and are more impulsive. So some events you may have to fill in a form and uh, they will select the, the talk, but some of some event you just have to get up early, go to the event and sign up early <laughs> to, to, to secure a spot to give a very, very short talk, uh, three to five minutes. So that is very good place to try out uh, speaking publicly. Or if you have an idea, you don't know whether it works, you can try it out with by starting it, it as a small talk. And if you think that mm, actually it works and people are really enjoying it and, you know, because uh, sometimes people will come to you after your lightning talk and say, oh, I really like your talk. So if it's a good idea, then you can expand it into a full length talk. So um, this is a very, very good way to start. Um, again, you have to think about whether you want to do it recorded or live, um, whether you want to do it online or in person, which one works for you the best. Um, for this one, I don't have uh, a one uh, solid recommendation for everybody because I think everybody is a little bit different. For me, I think I don't like recorded talk for the same reason that I would try to spend too much time to try to perfect it. When I look at myself in the recording, I really don't like it. I feel, you know, uh, you know, my hair will stand, you know, and so for me, I, I like give, giving live talk because it feels more like I'm talking to people, but uh, it's up to you. It's, it's fine, there's like, you know, everybody's different. You can just find a format that you feel comfortable to start. Um, another thing that I would recommend people who just started out is to not do live demos. Um, I keep having this conversation with people about, oh, I want to show something. And it seems like people really love live demos. Should I do live demo? And I always said that you don't have to do live demo for the sake of giving a live demo. If there's a conference that specifically ask for live demo, I think it's a little bit, um, it could be that the culture is a little bit toxic, but I don't know, but I just don't agree on the on the idea that you should always give a live demo. No, you, you don't have to, it, you know, if, if this demo is a demo, even if it's recorded, you can record your screen with some free software nowadays and, you know, just put the recording in one of, in your presentation slides and, it, you know, it, you just want to show how it works. You don't have to give it live if you don't want to. And especially for a new speaker, I think it's better to not do it live because I have done some live demo before and every time there's something that goes wrong, right? <laughs> so uh, if you're a new speaker, if you already plan and practice your demo, a lot of times if something small goes wrong, it may be because you're nervous, you have a little typo there, then it throws everything off the rail and everything is just different from what you planned. And then it's very, very hard uh, to adjust. And I don't recommend it for a new speaker. For more experienced speaker 
you can you can do live demo if you want. I mean, you you already experienced. You know how to handle the audience or anything that doesn't go according to plan. But for new speakers, I would say that if you can minimize the unknown, that would be better. So record your demos. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. Like the demo is a demo. You just want to show an idea, show something that works. You don't have to do it live all the time. Um, another thing you could do before your first talk is to rehearse with a mentor or a friend. Because, um, you know, it's, I know it's very, very scary to, um, you know, stand in front of a stage or do it, uh, you know, with a live audience. Like this is an environment that you are not familiar with and it's super tricky. And um, so rehearse it. I, I still rehearse talks. Uh, sometimes, like, for example, I want to check if I deliver my talk on time, um, whether things work or not, like, um, so yeah, I, I still practice nowadays, so don't feel shy, don't feel that, oh, I have to, you know, spend people's time, and again, like, people are very happy to help, even if you, for example, you're about to give a talk at a conference, you can just grab your friend and say, oh, you know, do you mind spending, like, where maybe your talk is half an hour, so I'm spending half an hour to sit with me in a quiet room and then I can, not the quiet room that you should not be talking, but like maybe a quiet corner <laughs> at a conference and, um, you know, so I can uh, rehearse my talk with you and then you can even ask them for some feedback. It's up to you. It depends on how much time you still have to change your talk. If your talk is the same day, maybe, um, you know, feedback that require a lot of changes is not super helpful <laughs> but um, you know you can re rehearse with your friend maybe you know oh let's do a uh, online call you know ahead of time and then or if you work in an office with a colleague you can just like oh maybe use a little bit of time at lunch to rehearse and they can give you feedback um so that would really help so another thing that uh if you want to try to give your talk at a conference then uh, you have to learn how to submit proposals. So, um, so I would say that submitting proposals is a very tricky business. Um, a lot of times the competition is very keen, especially the popular uh, conferences. So um, I would recommend if you are new to, uh, to submitting proposals, try to do it before the deadline try to do it uh, ahead of time. If you have a mentor or friend that can help you double check, you know, try to finish it a week before the deadline and ask your friend to so give them a week of time to have a look and then, you know, or maybe give them a few days to have a look, they will tell you back and then you still have a few days to adjust it before you submit it, before the deadline. So don't, uh, you know, do it last minute. It's very funny I say that because I'm a very last minute driven person, but, but, this is not good. Don't do it last minute. Um, some conference, they may extend the deadline, but don't rely on that. There are actually conferences that don't uh, extend the deadline or they receive enough proposal and they don't uh, extend the deadline. So don't uh, rely on the extension. So it's not always happen. Um, if you're thinking about, oh, what should I talk about? What should I write my proposal about? Think of something that you really care about, that you really want to tell people. Um, for example, why uh, you know, if you have opinion about certain tools, why you should use Polar and not Pandas, for example, or, you know, why you should always uh, write tests this way, or why you should always lend your code or something. So something you really care about, or something you think that, like, you know, your colleague keep doing it, and then <laughs> you don't like it, and you should tell people, don't do it, then well, something you really, really care, then that, that may be a good topic. Um, so I talk about, you know, something that your colleague does, a use case at work. For example, if uh, you use this technology at work and it works really well, you want to tell people about it, uh, that could be a good start. Well, of course, if you talk about things at work, you have to maybe um, see if the company is okay with it. If you maybe check with your manager, it's like, oh, I want to tell people about we are using this technology and it really works and this is how we work. Is it okay? Or your manager may say that oh you can but you some detail you can't tell you know so so check with your your work but but because you spend a lot of time at your work right you spend a lot of time working on the project and i think that um actually the opposite like for example some company really like it they was like, oh you represent our company and say that we are working very well it's good for the image of the company they may actually like you do this or give you some support in doing it maybe you don't have to take time off to go to the conference or something like that so um yeah so 
think of something that you really care about, maybe something you do at work, that is a very good start. Um, however, uh, something about, you know, what you do at work is good, but avoid sales speeches. Uh, I, I say that because I used to work in developer, you know, working as a developer as a coach for some company. A lot of times, of course, the company would want you to uh, tell people about certain products. But um, when I give a talk about certain product, I always make sure that it doesn't sound like a sales pitch, uh, maybe compare it with uh, competitors product and see the pros and cons need to be a little bit more balanced, but not just, you know, one sided opinions that make it into sales pitch. Um, and also always think about the educational value. So for example, again, if you talk about certain product or certain open source project, tell people like, you know, um, like, for example, teach people how to use it, or if you use it this way, it's better. Or uh, if you use this uh, product or this tool together with another tool that is good, or, um, you know, if you have this problem, you can use this tool to solve it. So educational value, what people can learn from your talk um, and wh why people should attend your talk. Um, that is a very good start. If you write that in your proposal, that would also uh, make your proposal easier to be accepted as well. And other trick, or no trick, uh, I, I don't know how to put it, but like sometimes, a lot of times in the proposals, you will have a uh, a box that is like, uh, you know, other comments that you want to say about your proposal that won't be public. Uh, so this is only for the reviewer or only for the organizer. Then you can think about saying that you identify, for example, as a women or identify as a black women or, you know, um, to identify yourself as from the um, underrepresented group. So I think uh, that, uh, you know, that that may not, you know, some some organizers will be having a double blind uh, selection, they won't have your name or like they won't show this, uh, this box to the reviewers. But if the at the end, the organizer, they really support the what I just said, a, a few slides ago that they want a diverse representation of speaker. They want a diverse representation of uh, of people from the underrepresented group, then um, helping them to get to know you instead of maybe they have to find you on LinkedIn, they have to find your GitHub or to figure it out who you are. If you just say that, then actually just make sure that they're aware that you are from the underrepresented group. Sometimes it, you know, it's not for you, but for the community, for the uh, organizers too to help them to have a better demographic of speakers. So another thing is that um, your proposal may get rejected and it's, and it's actually very common. A lot of experienced speakers, including me, still have proposal rejected all the time. <laughs> I, you, you see me being, you know, uh, talk, you know, giving talks here and there, I've been to a lot of places, but because I submit to even more of them. So there are some of them that got rejected, but it's, I never tell people, right? Because I won't put on, you know, Twitter or LinkedIn saying that, oh, I my talk at XYZ conference got uh, rejected. I won't say that, right? I will, oh, we only advertise the one that I got accepted. So, um, but yeah, the, the truth is, I'm not going to lie to you that I still got proposal rejected. Um, and it's very common, like my first one also got a, a rejected. So if you have tried to submit your proposal and it got rejected, don't feel bad. Sometimes not you, sometimes it's just that there are too many people submit the same topic, they will have to choose one and it happens to not be you, or is sometimes that topic is, you know, they may think that always oh, maybe not the, for example, if you submit something about a large language model to a maybe web developer conference, then maybe, you know, they think that, oh, our audience won't understand this topic. So maybe that's why they don't select it. So sometimes it's not about you, sometimes, it's about other reasons and don't feel bad and try again. You can submit the same proposal to another conference. Nobody's stopping you to do it, right? Just just try. Or even you can just contact your friend uh, at the local meetup and say, hey, I got this really cool idea. I haven't given it to any conference yet, but I would give it to you as a permit. I would, I would give it at your meetup first. So maybe they will say, oh, that sounds good. Come, come and give the talk. So. Um, don't feel bad if if, if, if the talk get rejected. It's, it's very common. It happens all the time to everybody. 
Um, so that's the end of all my tips <laughs> about how to start. Um, of course, there are a million more um, questions and things like that. I also have written a blog post about it. I can also share the link uh, in the in the group chat after as well. So uh, you can also read the blog post. Um, so, or you can get in touch uh, again, like I may not have time to mentor everybody, but if you just asking small questions, I would always try to find time to help you. So um, yeah, uh, good luck and try giving your first talk. I really wish you luck. I wish you having a successful uh, speaking journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chu. Thank you so much. It's been a very insightful session and I, I've also learned a new word, the main friends. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, if you have any questions for you, you can just put it in the channel. Um, and I'm I'm just going to start. So, for example, when submitting a talk proposal, would you recommend only submitting technical talks, or it can be like both technical talks or non-technical talks? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, what I would do is that I would sometimes uh, look at what they. Uh, what the talks are like last year at the conference because um, some conference organizer may may prefer technical talks or certain topics talk for example PyData they may like uh, machine learning you know large, large language model but they are not too interested in things like web development or Django so look at the uh, what has been chosen last year um, so that would give you some indicator of what they like some conference they would love more general topic, maybe, you know, they will have a track for only like how to take care of yourself as a developer or like how to find a job, like career and things like that. So uh, it really depends from conference to conference. So have a look at what they are doing last year. That would give you an indicator. It doesn't mean that they will always be the same, but usually it will be very similar to what happened the year before. Or if you know the uh, so some some conference they will have a ask me anything sessions. Uh, for example, Europython has one. So go there and ask uh, the organizer. So what kind of topic you are looking for? If they say, oh, you can submit anything, then that's good. But if they say, like, oh, we really like, you know, because uh, audience are beginners, uh, we like beginners talk, then you know what you can submit. So, um, or even like uh, if you if you really want to figure it out and they don't have that, you can send them an email see if. They can give you an answer. Um, so yeah, there's there's no uh, one size fit or answer here, but uh, you may have to do a little bit of research yourself. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, do we? Does anyone have any questions for Chuk? You can just put it in the chat, and then I'll read them out. Or you can also unmute yourself as well if you have questions for Chuk. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, so I have another question here because I, I submitted one of my talks like um recently and it was rejected just because like it wasn't a recorded event and they, they were not accepting like virtual talks or like recorded talks. In in that kind of situation or um and there was like a lot of like um, talks that they add and everything in that kind of situation what would you say like I should look out for maybe like that really appeals to um that really appeals to people when they are like pro um, checking out talk proposal and everything something I can put that really makes my talk proposal stand out yeah so I would say that uh usually the, the title is the most important part because that's the first thing that all the reviewers see. So having a very catchy title, sometimes, you know, using a pun or a joke that like really make people curious to, to read further, that would be a good start. Um, if you have a friend, again, like, you know, friends are very useful. Um, go bring some with your friend. It's like, oh, I'm going to talk about this. Like, we need the very catchy title. Let's 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 try to maybe have a chat to see, like, you know, play some games to see if we can find a very good title. Uh, after the title, that would be the the abstract or the shop description. Again, that's the second thing people see. Try to be precise about what you're going to tell, why people should go to your talk, why this talk is very important. Uh, try to you know, kind of like elevators. Peach, right? You have to like, you know, 
convince someone in a very short period of time. So that that's your second, uh, you know, second the, the second place you should put the most effort in. So a title and then the abstract is very important. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes you know, some places uh, they may want the speaker to be caught a little bit, like especially new speaker that hasn't have any you know things to show that they have been given talks before, that they may want uh, like a recording of yourself giving a talk. So that's why I think uh, giving a lighting talk would be a good start. So even if you haven't done it, you are submitting and they're asking for some demonstration of your speaking ability, then you can maybe try record yourself giving a five minutes lighting talk. <laughs> um, uh, that would also help. Um, so yeah, so um, again, yeah, you, the rejection may not be you are not good. Oh, another thing you can maybe uh, ask for the feedback of uh, why they reject your talk. Um, but I would say that take it with a grain of salt is not always very legitimate reason because a lot of reviewers, they just like thumbs up, thumbs down, give a score. They don't really write down the reason why they don't like your talk. So um, it's not always the case that a constructive feedback, but it's no harm asking. If you really want to know, you can ask why your talk is not selected. Is there any feedbacks that uh, from the reviewer that you can you receive? Um, but don't rely on that. I think keep trying is the, is the the best advice I could give you. So um, yeah. Oh great, thank you. Um, so while we're waiting for people to put their um, questions in the channel, I have like one final question. So mm -hmm. in a talk proposal description, what exactly do you like? Um, so there's this like talk proposal I saw that like elevator pitch and then description. Would what would you describe like for someone that's like just submitting a talk proposal for them to put in the description? Like how extensive do you want it to be or how small do you think it can be? Yeah, so uh that that's a very good question. So uh this it again like it depends on the conference. Some conference they may break down the two description like that you can have a short description and then a longer one and then um you can have even extra nooks and stuff. So my formula, it may not work for every everybody, it may not work for other conferences, but my formula is that you would need a, a first of all, you need one or two paragraphs at the beginning to um, maybe give a little bit background information about the topic. For example, if you're talking about a new tool, uh, let's say pandas, then you have well, well, most people know what panda is, but it, it, imagine like nobody know what panda is. Then you have to maybe explain a little bit what panda is. Panda is a a tool that you can you know ma manipulate the data to ha help you to manage the data in Python, and then Maybe you talk about or oh, why people should use Panda, then you, you give a brief idea of like why people should come to your talk or what they can gain from the talk. Um, I like also giving a small paragraph saying that this or this talk is for what kind of audience? Maybe this talk, this Pandas talk is for um, people who are working with data but have never used Pandas before. So it's a beginner's friendly talk. Or it could be, you know, in, you know, it could be like, oh, this is this pandas talk is for people who have used pandas for a while. They already know the basic, but they want to uh, know better what's the internal of pandas. Then like that, it's already different, right? Like the beginners level or advanced level. Or it could be like, oh, this talk is about uh, pandas use case. It's generally for everybody. You don't have to have the knowledge, but you know, anybody would get would have benefit from the talk. You know. A little bit of that. Um, so yeah, the background information, like uh, a little bit of like short outline, and then um, the, the what was it for the audience? What can the audience learn? Um, I would also, if it's a long description, I would add a session that is the outline of the talk. So I would put down like point form, maybe introduction, five minutes, and then a use case, another five minutes. You know, like list them out so that the organizer or the reviewer with you know that you have you already think about the talk. You are not just like giving a idea of a thin air. You have, you know, so they have more confidence in you that you could deliver this talk. So that's uh, that's what I would recommend people to construct their proposal. But again, this is how I do it. Like you, you don't have to copy me, you, you know. But I just think that this makes sense. That like oh, because think of if you are a reviewer, um, what do you want to see? Or if you want to get some experience as a reviewer 
you can volunteer to be a reviewer for some conference, then you would see other people's proposal, then you know what a reviewer wants to see, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's very insightful. So we have two questions in the chat, um, in the mm -hmm. channel. The first one is, um, how do you ensure you're not submitting a sales pitch for your proposal? Yeah, so uh, how to ensure or how to convince people is not the sales pitch. So again, think of educational value. Think of what can someone learn other than just like, oh, try this tool. Like, for example, let's say I... Well, I have never worked for MangoDB, but let's say I, I'm like, give a talk about MangoDB. How can this talk be not a sales pitch for MongoDB and just ask people to sign up and use MongoDB, right? I can, for example, it's a use case. Like, for example, I have, uh, I, I'm working for a, a company that do a lot of social media data. I can put them in MongoDB and it works, you know? So that's a use case. So it's more like about the case, like about how MongoDB solved my problem of having lots of social media data. So that is one of the, 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 the things to uh, approach it. Or the other is like, oh, MongoDB versus let's say SQL, <laughs> uh, MySQL, okay? So you are comparing two products, then, you know, um, then you're not just mentioning MongoDB, MongoDB, MongoDB. You're also like, oh, comparing SQL. And you can also say like in the description, say we will compare pros and cons and at which use case is better to use which, you know, then people know that it's kind of like a more like a balanced comparison talk. So um, yeah, think of it as like, not just talking about one product, think of maybe some use case. What can people learn? Because people may have the same problem with the social media data, then they will, oh, maybe, I could try MongoDB or like someone uh, struggling or which one should I use? Then they can you know, think of if a audience, what can they learn except uh, just try out that product, right? What else can they learn from the talk? Yeah. Um, great, great, thank you. The second question, for someone transitioning into a new role, how do you go about delivering a talk on your career change and um, both technical and non-technical thoughts? Mm. So I think for technical talk, if you are changing career, you can, because you want to, uh, for example, let's say you change into data science, right? So you want to show that you actually know data science. So you can learn a little bit about the new role that you, or new field that you want to change into, and then give a technical talk in that, in that field. So like, for example, I want to become a data scientist. Then I learn, let's say, how to uh, build a, um, a uh, let's say, neural network uh, with NumPy. <laughs> it's, it's silly, but you know. Oh, and but that would be, for example, I imagine if if I show it to my future employer, they would think that oh, I I actually have some knowledge in data science. I I'm you know I can I have coding skills. And so you can give a talk about that, about like oh how to build a neural network with NumPy. Don't do it. That's a silly example, but <laughs> but yeah, think about something related to data science and then give the talk, technical talk about that. Show that you have learned that in your free time. Show that you have the skills to do it. You can show maybe some code demo of the things you have done. Put the GitHub link there so people can check it out. Give you a star, whatever. Um, so so that would really help you in your career change. About non-technical, I think you can change the approach a little bit, or maybe like some opinion about, let's say, uh, why use this model. Uh, so let's do a little bit technical, like let's say op opinion about um, why you think that it's very important to uh, to do data science without the bias. Some opinion about the new field that, so if you show it to your future employer, so it's non-technical talk, but they think that, oh, you're passionate about it. You, you have pay attention to this field. You have see some problems that are happening in this field may not necessarily be technical. So um, yeah, so try to think of something to talk about in the new field that you want to change into. So people know that you're passionate about it. You are actually, you know, you, you're ready to take a role and work with your peer who is already in that role for a while because you speak about a similar topic that they would probably speak. So um, I think that would be a good approach to, to do that. Um, just a quick one. For the technical part, would you say like switching programming languages as well, like moving from one previous programming language to another one 
that would also cover like having much knowledge about that new program language yeah i think also you you can be you can be honest right you don't have to for example let's say i want to change from python to rust so i'm like i'm learning rust but i'm not a rust expert you don't have to pretend to be a rust expert you can say like oh this is my journey of learning rust this is a few things that i realized that rust is different from python and that's why like using rust can solve some of the problems that python can solve so um having those insights also help and people know that you know you probably are not looking for a senior rust developer role you may be looking for some like junior to mid level and if you can show that you have good insights then people will you know will give you bonus point when you when you are five or rows yeah yeah Oh, great. Thank you so much for your time, Chuk. And I hope everyone has really learned a lot. I have personally. So I want to say a very big thank you. Um, It's time now. So we'll be ending this call. So I'm just going to like end the call with appreciating everyone for joining the session. I hope it has been a very insightful session. And we are going to prove them wrong by submitting our proposals. <laughs> Please. Um, there's a form, there's a survey form on the channel, on the general channel. Please, everyone, let's all fill the form for on the channel. Um, yeah, it's going to share it again so everyone can see. So let's all fill the survey form. And I also hope to see everyone on in more upcoming Pilates events. Thank you once again, everyone. Thank you once again, Chuk, for joining. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Bye, yeah, everyone. Thank you.